My Goat's Love, Oak Branches. Did you guys hear me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sarah, you're on m mute, so I'm not sure oh. if you're talking. Sorry. Jerry, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Oh, sure. Uh, my name's Jerry Switzer. I'm a treasurer of the organization. Uh, my ghosts love pine needles on branches. Awesome. Um, Aaron, Jennifer? Hi, uh, I'm Aaron. Jenny's over there, actually, in the kitchen. Um, and we're in Minnesota. Um, we just have two SCI goats, and then we have nine uh, mixed goats. Um, and they love to bunch on the bucks on it. Uh, her. Um, Becky? Oh, Becky's a moment, busy at the moment. Erin, Link, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Erin Link. I have a farm in western Wisconsin not too far from Erin uh, and Jennifer, and been raising San Clemente since 2013. And I would say right now their favorite forage is only hay, but, like, that's all they have. But I have been growing a uh, willow on purpose and then uh, cutting that back and using that as uh, tree hay. So that would be their favorite if they had access to it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Becky, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Um, my name's Becky. I'm in Moonlit Pastures Farm. We live in Tennessee. That's one of my kids, my son. Um, right now, my goats don't have much forage where they are, but they really like to eat privet, so I would not recommend do not grow privet. <laughs> <laughs> Good idea. Um, yeah, very So. Um, right so. now... I one doe, a buck, and two kids. Unfortunately, I lost one of my does to electric fence, so I'm down to oh, doe. But. No. Yeah. I have her, so I'm going to keep the doing, but yeah. That sucks. Those of us who run electric probably have all been there, done that at once. Ugh, it really does suck. So I'm Sarah, um, and we're Scarberry Homestead. We're in um, northern central Virginia, and in this weather, our goat's favorite um, forage is honeysuckle. It is, in here in Virginia, it is green year-round, and so they love it. And hopefully soon, because we're starting to see buds breaking, um, otherwise their other favorite, um, but their all-time favorite forage is mulberry. They love mulberry leaves, and um, huge, huge fans. So, and it's really good for them because it has an amazing nutritional value. So, and it grows quickly. So, all right. Well, thank you guys all for coming. I have a question. Sure. On your honeysuckle, is that just like standard honeysuckle or is it a specific one? Because I have honeysuckle, but I haven't fed it to them. Um, we do have native honeysuckle here in Virginia, which I don't feed to my goats, not because they won't eat it, but because I'm trying to propagate it. Um, so we feed them Japanese honeysuckle. So it's probably what you have. It has the white flowers with the little yellow um, yeah. pistons and stamens. And it is an invasive that grows like there's no tomorrow. So we let them eat as much as they want. And honeysuckle actually has a nutritional value equivalent to alfalfa. So very high, um, yeah, really great. And if you have it, I su definitely suggest it and let them go at it. Okay. So they'll even strip in fresh, if it, you have um, fresh growth, they'll even strip like the stems of the little of the outer covering. I guess I wouldn't call it bark, but yeah. yeah. All right. Ours, Who's George? Well, I'm sorry, what? We have George. George. Hi, George. Oh. <laughs> Hi, folks. Hold on. I, I had trouble getting in, oh. so 
a little late. I assume we're doing introductions? Yes, right? we are. Uh, so go ahead, introduce yourself, George, and your goat's favorite forage. <laughs> this time of year? Whatever the hell we give <laughs> Any them. Any time of the year. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, the, uh, so George Sawyer, I'm uh, Wild Haven Farm, and we're in Minnesota. Um, and uh, really the, I don't know that they have a, we don't have a whole lot of forage that we've had them on. Most of ours is just uh, opportunistic grasses out in the, um, out in the part of the pasture that we've started already. So we're fairly new new to this. Um, but they'll, they'll eat just about anything. We, they're, they're loving the pine trees right now. We're throwing them old Christmas trees uh, this time of the year. That is awesome. Well, welcome. Oh, and somebody else logged in. Let me see. Hold on. Oh, we have Charles who does not have a microphone, I know. Um, Charles is interested in SEIs. He currently raises Nigerian dwarfs in, I get it wrong every time, Charles. Is it Northwest Mississippi or Northwest Alabama? And I know I should remember by now, but I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, And Charles is a happy hour regular, so I'm glad he's here. Great. All right. Well, tonight's topic is testing, registration, and how to make them profitable. And we're going to start with Laurel, who is the chairman for our registry. And um, she's just going to talk a little bit about the registration process and sort of how, why, and the benefits of registering. And go ahead, Laurel. I'll hand it over to you. Okay. Well, I'll just kind of go through the process a little bit. Um, since our registry is so young, we automatically included in the registry already all of the goats that were in our um, herd book. So it might be that your goats are already in the registry. Are, are you still getting me okay? I'm getting some weird... Okay. Anyway... Um, so the first thing to do is to check with me or with Laura Temple. Her email address is on the website um, to find out if your goats are already registered, in which case you would want to get what's called a duplicate certificate, you know, because you're not registering them brand new. You just want to get, get their registration certificate from our registry. And that um, is only $4 per goat. And then um, any goat that is not already included in the registry, you would do a standard registration form on. So any questions about that? Does the breeders have to register or can buyers register? Well, ideally, the, the person that you bought them from would do an official transfer. You know, so that's, that's ideal. Okay. And when you sell a goat, ideally, you would register it before you sell it because you have to, we need a signature of the owner just so that, you know, people aren't just, making up goats and registering them so that there's, you know, there's some um, accountability, like for where that goat came from and who its ancestors are, um, and that comes from the breeder and them signing the form that, yes, that's who this goat is and it's going to Becky. Okay. Laurel, would you would you say that's as part of the bill of sale in itself as well that's attached? Well, you know, we don't really have a bill of sale oh, okay. in the registration process. Okay. It's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Because we you know, it's like I always give bill of sale and I will transfer the goat. 
you know, I just, the bill of sale is sort of a, um, it's actually a good question we, we should figure out because it's a little bit duplicative, mm. you know, but I still think it's important and it's actually not requested in any of the registration forms. But what is requested is the signature of the owner who's transferring the goat to you. So sometimes if someone, you know, they have a bill of sale, but they the prior owner didn't do a um, official transfer, we can use the bill of sale. Because the bill of sale, if it has the uh, prior owner's signature on it, Okay, yeah, because that was, I remember running into that previously, like, I had bought goats from a woman, and I had the bill of sale, I had all the, the hootenanny, but um, there was, with a different thing, but there was issues because there wasn't a bill of sale from the original breeder. Is that an issue here? No. Okay, cool, yeah. That's <laughs> That's We're trying mean. to keep things simple yeah. and straightforward, you know. Perfect. We don't have to go tracking down the whole life of the goat through all the prior owners. Got it. Yeah. You think, I was going to say, do you want to, why do you want people to register their goats, Laurel? Why is it important? Okay. Um it keeps track of the goats. You know, we have uh, we have a lot of goats out there that we don't know who they are. We don't know where they came from. We don't know what their lineage is. You know, and that can open the door to crossbreeds that we don't know about. You know, so it's like you register the goat. It's part. It's part of the breed. It's it's counted. We know where it is. We know who it belongs to. We know who its parents are. You know, it's it's really important. And it also counts towards, you know, we want to get the San Clemente Island goats off the critically endangered list. And in order to do that, the, land, the Livestock Conservancy needs a certain number of goats that are being registered every year. And uh, so that will help toward that, too. I just think, you know, for me personally, I don't buy goats that aren't registered or that don't have their parents registered because I want to know who they are. I want to know what their lines are. I want to know um, how to pair them so that they're, they're not being, you know, paired with their brother. You know, me, if you don't know who the goat is, you don't know who to breed it with. <laughs> Laurel, I think that's really important too because I, right, that's just kind of been an issue sometimes when uh, when things get lost. I mean, we can, we're starting over, we're trying to collect everybody, but also like <laughs> my, my first group of goats were this like, <laughs> you know, and, and as a first time go owner, not a first time go owner, but I just had mixed breeds before that I was just, you know, I wasn't, I was serious about them, but not registering them or anything. So I was a little bit, I was very naive. And, and in hindsight now, I'm like, I can't believe I actually like did that. <laughs> because I had, you know, I was, pro you know, I was told I would get more information on them, but like, yeah, like it, to me, uh, like at that time, Here's there were so few, um, okay. there were so few animals Wait, that froze. like you froze. I yeah. I was okay. I was told that um it didn't matter who the goats were really bred to as long as there were more. I was kind of told that sort of narrative a long time ago, so it's <laughs> very interesting. Anyways, yeah, it's, it's just really nice to be able to look back at records and being able to share those records and like people can keep even better records of like health of the animal like production and all that stuff it'll be so helpful to future breeders as well so yeah for example you know we came across a herd out here in california that had been off the radar nobody had known about it it was a large herd it had been interbred 
for like 20 years. You know, they started with five goats and they had a Nigerian dwarf in there for a while and, you know, a male and and then they just they just freely bred for 20 years. So it's like a very inbred herd. But again, but still with no documentation of who was whose parent or anything. You know, and then so that person, the owner of that herd had a terrible health thing and the whole herd got dispersed. And it's like, so here's this herd that got dispersed to these new breeders and they're having kids and it's like this whole section that we don't know who those goats are. <laughs> so we're trying to, you know, be better custodians of the breed by registering them, keeping track of who they are, who they should be bred with. So I got knocked off for a second, so I'm sorry if I repeat anything, but um, what I did here is so true. We've been breeding since 2008, and our first goats from came from a well-known breeder, and the only papers we got were, well, we've sold goats to A, B, C, and D, so don't ever buy goats from A, B, C, and D because they'll be too closely related. Well, we don't know, did they get full siblings, half siblings, are they aunts, cousins? you know, yeah. cousins 10 times removed. I don't know. Um, yeah, it was in the sort of the Wild West breeding of um, San Clemente's. And so I'm really happy that everything is changing. And um, I see very in the near future that people will be able to get pedigrees with five generations and they'll be able to see exactly who these goats are related to and be able to find if they want to lion breed, goats that are closely related, or if they want, you know, somebody completely different. Sorry, cat with an allergy. Um, <laughs> somebody completely different. And I, so I think that's exciting. Um, what was I going to say? Anything else about registration you want to say, Laurel? You know, um, sometimes each person needs specific help getting through our uh, process because it's new to us, it's new to you, and we have that help. So, um, here to help. <laughs> Give me a second, guys. I am um, switching my internet because you're freezing, and I think, can everybody hear me? I don't know if I'm freezing. Yes. Yeah, we um, can hear you. Yes. Okay, that's good. Um, okay. Along with... The recording has started. Ooh, that's much better. Hold on a sec. Okay, there. Um... And along with registration, the other component is DNA testing. And in case you have not noted, the members voted and um, starting December 31st this year, so basically January 1st of next year, all sires need to be DNA tested and on file with the association. So that means, you know, basically to put it, word it another way, if you wish to register a GOAT, their sire needs to have been DNA tested with us. Um, and that can be done through, um, we use UC Davis's um, veterinary genetics lab. They have a, what did we say, Laurel, 10 day turnaround period. You submit your own DNA and when you submit it, you click, there's what's called an affiliate account. You click on the the San Clemente Island Goat Breeders Association, you get a discount on your test, and you get emailed your report, and we get emailed your report. And you have full ownership over your report. You always get a full report. You are able to order further tests if you want. Um, you don't need to go through the association to do that, and you don't need to go through the association to get the full report. 
Um, Laurel, anything you want to add about DNA testing? Um, just that it's really straightforward now, the way that we have it set up with uh, BGL. And as Sarah said, it's a 10 business day turnaround. You know, um, we have many breeders that have done it a different way, and they are like stymied for over a year, not getting results. And uh, that's not the case if you do it this way. And we have all the steps laid out on our website under the DNA page. And um, the reason that we want the association to have a copy is that it's available uh, for um, possible future research. You know, if someone wants to uh, research. Well, here's an example. Um, I don't know if you all know who Dr. Phil Sponenberg is. He wrote the book uh, Managing Breeds for a Secure Future about, you know, rare breeds. He's a real he's like a genetic expert for goats. We love him so much. <laughs> but, you know, he, there was a breed of goat that we were um interested in how it relates to San Clemente Island goats. And so we were able to, I was able to send him about 20 different um, DNA reports from goats of mine, of other breeders that I had on file, and he knew how to look at them and compare them with this other breed and come up with a conclusion about how were they related. So that's an example where if I didn't have access to these other breeders' reports, I wouldn't have been able to do that. I could only send them mine, which would be, a, you know, like eight reports, you know, very limited. Um, another great point is that um, BGL holds on to all of the DNA samples um, for future possible testing, but at some point they decide to purge the records their DNA. Before they do that, they try to contact an owner, Well, which is fine if you submitted your DNA maybe last year, even within the past 10 years. But what if it's 50 years from now? I'd love to think I'd be alive in 50 years, but let's face it, at 100, that's probably not happening. But they will contact the association because they have, they're the second person on file. And so basically the association could take possession of all STI DNA of owners that are no longer traceable or, you know, and so I think that's really important too, so that we have that library, not, you know, it's easy to think about, yes, it's like next week or next year, but ideally the association and the breed will be here, you know, many decades in the future when the rest of us are all gone eventually and um, <laughs> be able to access the DNA and the reports and stuff like that. And I think that's really interesting. Um, we're so small right now, but think about something huge like Holstein. My great grandfather was a whole um, dairy farmer, and at the turn of the 18th, no, turn of the 19th century, I mean, you can go back into their registry for Holsteins, and you can find Holsteins registered to him. And I think that's amazing. And let's face it, I mean. If they had DNA back then, you, it would still be on record with them. And uh -huh. so that's sort of where we're looking at. It's hard sometimes to look that far in the future and try to be prepared. But I think in this case, we really are, you know, thinking ahead. And hopefully our breeders will agree with us and um, DNA test and let us have, you know, the access to it. Um, something else to point out, and we double checked this with BGL, in fact, just yesterday, it's, there's a lot of um, misconception going around that these DNA reports are like medical people's medical records and that they're protected by HIPAA. If you don't know what HIPAA is, um, it is a federal law <laughs> for protection of um, medical records. Well, the DNA records from BGL are not protected under HIPAA. They are not medical records. Um, the amount of privacy is simply 
the report is sent to you and you can decide who does or doesn't see it. But you are more than welcome to photocopy your report or email it to anybody and everybody you want, including the New York Times. If for some reason, that's what you wanted to do. Um, you don't need to worry about that. Um, so I do want to make sure that misconception is cleared up. Um, any other additives about DNA testing? Uh, well, just that, you know, when you test your buck and that DNA is on record, if, if that buck goes to somebody else or that buck uh, gets another goat pregnant, somehow gets on their property or something, and they don't know who the father is, they c can figure that out with his DNA markers. Very true. Good point. Um, so we talked right. about registry, <laughs> DNA testing. Oh, go ahead. The other type of testing is, um, hold on, it's my mind, is whole herd testing. And um, does anybody test their herd currently? Okay. Um, it's very popular in um, traditional dairy herds. And it's almost a requirement, I mean, it's not a requirement, but it's definitely what people look for is um, kid support courtesy. <laughs> <laughs> um, CAE, CL, and Yonis are the three big diseases that um, we see in goats. Meat goats don't, don't seem to really care about as much as dairy goat people do. Um, and so as we try to break into the traditional goat community, I really encourage um, people to look at annual testing. It's a blood test. You can pull a vial, send it to the lab. Um, here in Virginia, I do it through VDAC, which is our state veterinary lab. Um, most states have a, most states should have a vet lab that you can run it through or through a local university. A big one is Waddle, Waddell. I don't quite know how you say the acronym, um, which is in Washington State. Yeah. And um, yeah, that's true. Erin was saying if you want to sell to any of the non traditional breeders like zoos, they require a lot of testing. Um, and you just do it annually because it is highly contagious to goats. So if you have it on your farm, um, Terry, I know, is familiar with Yoni's, not because he's had it, but because he was going to buy goats from Bergen County Zoo in New Jersey, and their herd popped. And guess what? Terry did not get goats. Um, we have a breeder in Minnesota who uh, unfortunately basically had to butcher her, almost her entire herd of not just San Clemente's, but Nigerian dwarfs and Arapawas because they popped for Yoni. Um, so I definitely encourage you to look into it, talk to your vet. Um, and I also encourage you, if you um, have the stomach for it, learn how to draw blood on your goat. It really <laughs> will save you a ton of money. Um, you know, have your vet come out once, so you had to do it. Have a sister who's a vet tech who can do it. Um, I know. Um, and it's not hard to do, especially once somebody shows you how to do it. Um, and again, you can just order the vials online, and you can ship overnight. But it's, I encourage everyone to, you know, look into it. Definitely give it a try and a thought. Um, yeah, another another point in favor of that, I do keep a clean tested herd as well. And it makes it easier for, you know, if if I want to take a goat to somebody else's farm for something, and if they don't, if, if their herd is tested clean, it's a much easier um, thing to do. And Or if somebody wants to bring a goat to me to have it, you know, bred by one of my bucks, I demand it's got to have been tested. If it hasn't, if it's not from a clean tested herd, then it has to be tested before it comes. And it's just a level of, you know, uh, makes you feel better. <laughs> well, it's true. And um, again, if you 
you know, if you're trying to sell to actual goat people, especially anybody that's had dairy goat or has dairy goats or had dairy goats, they are familiar with the testing and a lot of times they'll ask for it. And if you don't test, you've lost a buyer. They will keep moving and looking for somebody who tests. And unfortunately, um, until recently, it's more, you know, it's definitely not prevalent community wide yet, but more people are testing. We are starting to see, you know, um, other goat breeders look at us and finally be like, okay, I can actually look at San Clemente's now because there are breeders that meet my qualifications. And so we're happy to hear that. Um, yeah, it's okay. like, it's, a, it's like an almost always, it, it seems like it always comes back negative, you know, but with Terry, with Terry, when he was working with the, the zoo, you know, it was like everything was a go finally after months of working to get this for, figured out. And, and we said, test the goats. <laughs> and it's like, oh, no. You know, they had, a, they had positive Yanis. And it's like, oh, my God, they had no idea. And this is the zoo who has really, they have really high standards for, you know, their stuff. So it was kind of shocking. But so glad that, you know, he asked them to do that. We we do we do annual screens on the entire herd rather than a whole sample or rather than the sample, and it was because we had a a case that made it through the uh, quarantine, but later tested positive. They were pre-shedding, so they 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 were too early on in the onis, uh, and it didn't get caught until a mm -hmm. subsequent scan. So, you know, the annual scans for the whole herd are. I can't say enough for how important those are because it'll creep in. It's it's out there. Definitely. And, you know, um, I think CL is a big one. If CL won't necessarily kill a goat, um, but and goat, a herd can survive with it, but some of the meat people just think, ah, CL, they'll, they'll put like formalin, formalin, I think is it, on it, and they'll just be like, yeah, not a big deal. You know, so make sure you ask questions when you're buying goats. Also, so if, you know, clean tested herds is important, make sure you know that um, ahead of time and you ask questions. Um, the other thing I was going to say, too, is I recommend every few years, if you're clean testing, shopping around as far as pricing. We used to send um, our blood samples out of state, and finally, Virginia's prices got competitive so we could just the state lab is actually in my town so you know i can just go a few miles down the road and hand deliver it no more overnight shipping or anything um so but i never would have realized that if i hadn't continued you know every few years checking pricing so i recommend that any other stories or questions concerns go ahead erin I maybe i'm jumping the gun and you're going to talk about it but with the dna testing part um, were you guys going to talk about how when you, with the DNA testing of the sire, like how it might be important to also DNA test the um, dam as well, even though you know the kid came out of her, but in regards to the San Clemente part and everybody being pretty related. Um, yeah, I have an answer on that. Um, okay, okay, cool. If the dam and the sire have, you know, are related, you know, fairly closely related, you do need to test both the dam and the sire, and they talk about that on the VGL uh, website. Okay. So that would be probably really true for, like, well, not necessarily, but, like, for line breeding, let's say, would be a really good example, but... Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. For example, I, ha I had a... a uh, let's see what, what, what... I'm trying to remember what that was. I had a, a doe that had kids, but she had just arrived pregnant, you know, like an unexpected pregnancy, and we didn't know who her sire, who the sire was. I knew for sure who the dam was. I mean, I was there when she had the kids, so I'm like, I don't need to send in the dam sample. You know, I don't need to pay an extra $31, you know. And um, so we just sent in, there were four possible sires, right? So we sent in um, stuff for the four different sires, and the kid, and it came back saying, so-and-so is the sire. 
And then there was some question that came up, and it was like, oh, no, you have to send in the dam. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is ridiculous. I know she had the kid, you know. But I did it, and lo and behold, it was a different sire because the one that we thought was the sire was very closely related to her. <laughs> so it required both the dam and the sire in order to really figure that out. Yeah. I learned and the hard way. <laughs> and I think it's something, too, which I forgot the technical term for it, but I found out oh, this the hard way myself with other goats is that a sire – or there can be multiple, you, a doe can get pregnant by multiple bucks. Which Correct. Is, yeah, so that's also another thing. Uh, yeah, it's why we run, we keep a bachelor herd far and away from our does, and only one buck runs with them. So there's never a question as to who the father is because there was no buck near them. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is, we always recommend whether you're going to send in DNA immediately or you're not sure if you're going to is keeping sort of a DNA library um, so that every goat on your property you have taken samples from, you have, and you can find this information on the VGL website, um, how to pull, put it into a clean paper envelope, um, label it with who the dough is, all the, or dough, who the goat is, all the relevant information, and keep it, oh, excuse me, in a um, cool, dark place. I And you want it, um, I think, like a shoebox or something is probably a good place because, of course, you don't want dampness to get into it. And file it away so you have it for a rainy day. Um, it's $31 to test hair. If for some reason you have to pull a jaw, is it a tooth I think they take it from? If you have to pull bones from a dead goat because you need DNA later, that's like two fifty a pop. So <laughs> nobody one, nobody wants to be digging through their compost pile or garden and nobody wants to be paying that amount of money. Um, so I definitely recommend a library for a later day. <clears throat> okay. So probably what everybody's actually tuned in to hear about now that we've chatted about testing and DNA and registration is how to make these profitable. Um, I think people, you're putting out money and you don't necessarily see how the money is going to come back in. And that's just reality. I mean, everybody has limited finances or I'll take it back. Most of us have limited finances. And so um, I guess the first thing is the obvious benefit of um it should be part of your marketing. I mean, if you are a registered herd, if you are DNA tested, if you are a clean herd and you test annually, make sure that has value. That makes you that gives you an added benefit as a seller and makes you more attractive to buyer. Um, we don't want to, you know, devalue any other SDIs because you know, our numbers are low, but that's just the reality of it. Um we run a herd of La Manchas for uh, our dairy. And let's face it, I mean, I want registered La Manchas. I want them that have no confirmations who I can look at their dams and sires and know, you know, going back four or five generations, what their milk production was like. I want to know, um, you know, what lines I have so that I can stick to certain lines because they, you know, have such amazing dairy quality. We right now have a line that gives us three, at, at, at top production annually, gives us three gallons of milk a day. Well, do you know how hard it would be to track the, I mean, trying to find related goats to add if I didn't have that registered goat and the pedigrees and access to the pedigrees? It'd be nearly impossible. And But it's not, because all I have to do is go online and pop in my, you know, my goat's name and registration number, and all that information pops out at me. Um, and because I have all that information, you know, she's worth what I, I would pay for her twice over for what I paid for her, versus another La Mancha who maybe gives, who maybe does give three gallons a day, but I don't know 
that she's tested. I don't know she's clean. I don't know that I can, you know, pop her into my milk program and my customers are going to be safe. Um, and that's, you know, the same applies to San Clemente. Um, what other, anybody else have thoughts on something like that, like the, how to market or ideas on utilizing? <clears throat> testing and clean herds as part of your marketing? I I actually haven't really been explicit about that piece of marketing for myself anyways. Um, when people ask, it's like, yeah, but I, I, I don't know. Like I, I've like for my own business and everything and my costs, like, it's like the cost of these things is wrapped up into like the price that I'm asking that, you know, I started off with this, like this goal of the goats, you know, years ago, I want, I'm like, I want the goats to at least pay for their themselves and then, and then rolling off from that. And um, I don't, I mean, it's just like pricing. I don't, is this pricing the goats appropriately? So it covers your cost and maybe you, it can be profitable. Like, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I haven't rolled it up into marketing, but it's just, yeah, that's just what I've been doing anyway. I I think it's we 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 market mostly uh, fainters, and they're sold mostly as pets. Um, and the I, it's been a differentiator for us that we test, we're registered, we we take care of them. We're we're actually working on our certified humane uh, certification, and it's. For us, it's it's just that's the right thing to do. But from a marketing standpoint, it 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 is a label that you can put on there, and it differentiates us from all the everybody that's selling a fifty dollar goat from their backyard. Yeah. And if, let's face it, we're we're competing against that to a certain extent, not with San Clemente, certainly with fainters. Hmm. That's definitely true, George. Um, we raised American guinea hogs and um, they're no longer on the critical list but they used to be and I'm thinking looking ahead trying to make sure that we position our breeders for the future so that they're not behind the eight ball but instead they're way in front um, at some point I do think we'll start to see and not tomorrow definitely not within I think the next two or three years but I think when we start to look at like five years out we'll start to see two classes of San Clemente sort of the registered ghosts which go for a premium price and then the unregistered San Clemente which is simply the name and the look but are unregisterable and that's definitely what we saw with you know our guinea hogs that a registered mm -hmm. guinea hog you know, definitely goes for two, three, sometimes depending on the genetics, four times what, i.e., a feeder guinea hog goes for that's unregisterable. And I think, you know, um, I mean, that's something else to keep in mind, too, depending on, you know, eventually what kind of numbers you have. You know, do you have sort of this lesser grade of San Clementes for somebody who just wants a pet or a grazer or something um, that you can, you know, sell? Um, what was I going to say? But I definitely, um, I think also then going into that is how do you, we had a breeder have a slight meltdown because she suddenly realized she had to come up with money for DNA testing. And we're like, well, how do you make that pay? Like, so you're not putting out DNA testing money. And I think you definitely write it into your price. But I think the thing to remember is in general, <laughs> DNA testing um, takes 10 days. And most people are selling their goat even a minimum of a month out. You know, so go ahead, take a down deposit and make sure it's large enough to pay for, oh, and registration, we're at a month at the moment, but it should be down. And that's because we're still working out glitches. But, um, you know, in general, the, the registration should take two weeks. So take a deposit. And make sure it's enough to pay for the DNA testing and the registration and transfer. You didn't put any mm -hmm. money, you know, um, mm -hmm. the buyer did. 
Um, and I think that's something people need to start thinking about. Like, it's not just cash you're getting in hand. It's cash to make sure you are able to pay, you know, for what you advertised in your marketing and are making you a good breeder. Um, other thoughts or suggestions? Erin? So, so what is the total cost thing for go for DNA and registration? Is it like 40 Is it forty dollars? It would minus post postage and handling. Mm -hmm. It is. Oh wait, registration for. Oh goodness, off the top of my head, is it seven dollars for members of the association, Laurel? Like yeah, seven dollars. So yes, yeah, thirty-one plus the seven, thirty-eight dollars. Oh. And then seven dollars for transfer. Oh, and seven dollars for the transfer. So thirty-eight, forty. Let's have forty-five dollars. Fifty-dollar well, deposit pays for the envelopes okay. and the post. <laughs> You're going to have to up your fee there, Aaron. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to remember that. Uh, up my what? <laughs> You're going to have to up your fee. Oh, I know. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm I like, shouldn't have reminded I, you I'm of that. I'm talking to my hey guy pretty soon. <laughs> No, the, this year's price will go the same. I'm going to talk to my hay guy pretty soon, but I also am so lucky to get insanely cheap, decent hay. So that's, are, that's is anybody where do, I'm at. <laughs> you're, not do, you're not doing organic, are you? Mm -mm. Bramble? But, I mean, there's, are, are you doing? Okay. We're non-GMO soy free. Ooh. I like the soy free. I can't, I can't, get, my local guy that I really want to do business with can't do soy free, so I'm not doing soy free. We are lucky to have a local mill that does all of our feed, and better yet, they do um, a regional delivery service, and the regional delivery drop point is two miles down at the end of my road. So, mm. so it's actually... Not quite door to door, but almost door to door. Yeah, so we were lucky to get the soy free non GMO. Um, mm. We looked. We do have an organic mill, but I just couldn't justify the organic cost. Well, for, we're doing um, my we're doing all, <laughs> Yeah, it's it's expensive. We're doing all hay. Uh, we don't do grain with the the goats, and so we're doing organic hay, and the soy free. Uh, it really, it just applies to the poultry, and that's an hour. That's an hour one way to pick that up. <laughs> so I got nothing two miles down the road, <laughs> I said, which I, I did. <laughs> I know. Um, like an hour and well, a half, so she, but that would just be for the chickens, also. Otherwise, where, where are you getting from? Uh, currently, we just get from our local mill um, pool. Okay. Um, by um, but we get our hay from a couple of farmers within an hour of us, and then my his father, well, Chef's father and mother started experimenting with cutting hay, but it's not. Mm -hmm. hay. But oh. <laughs> basically organic because they don't do anything with their property. Yeah. It was very wild. But she also takes my trailer, loads it, brings it back to me. So I don't even. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Fantastic for us. I like how we got the Minnesota thing, uh, the Minnesota Wisconsin thing going here. The whole Midwest, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're gonna be the center of all San Clemente in come come a couple of years. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to be able to have not necessarily like certified organic, but have things, you know, as clean as possible. But you know, when it comes yeah. down to cost, you know, we've got a few disagreements here. So, well, it's 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 can you get you know can you upsell enough? You know, can you work it into the cost? Because yeah, it's ex it's expensive. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We'll we'll have to talk sometime. We're gonna do a we're gonna do a farm tour. We're gonna to do a farm spot. Yeah. <laughs> I love how these happy hours work. This yeah. is so cool. But um, what was I gonna say? No, I definitely. Um, feed is definitely a huge aspect of marketing. Um, we run a meat CSA, and I mean, 
the soy free is what puts us, you know, non GMO, at least in our area, is a given. If you're not non GMO, you might as well not even bring your meat to the market. Um, mm. And and that's mainly for poultry. Um, yeah, it's just, hmm. I mean, or at least you're not going to be making the money that um, you probably need to, to for the profit. Soy free for us is the added benefit um, above our most of our competitors. But um, as far as, but San Clemente's really do well on forage only. Um, and I highly encourage people, if you're in a location that you think is pretty permanent, to really invest in improving your forage um, over time. I'm a huge proponent of um, forage chicory. If you're not familiar with it, looking into it, um, I know chicory is, there's, we have wild chicory here, but forage chicory is almost more like a planting lettuce in your field versus, you know, our chicory is a small, Silver. yeah, um, forage chicory, chicory has been tested in scientific testing and proven to be a natural dewormer for goats mm. and sheep. So it's definitely a huge benefit if um, we do meat rabbits, and I haven't seen it tested, but our local university um, has started doing research, and they are seeing, and hopefully we'll have a paper soon, that chicory in their forage diet and their pasture-raised rabbits adds meat faster. So um, huge mm. component of chicory. Um, I encourage people to look at silvo pasture if you have the capability. Um, Adding trees and brambles to your pasture, you can really increase. Um, we're able to get two to three times the stocking, traditional stocking rate for our area because we've gone vertical. And we are working with a group who is paying us to put in silvo pasture. And they are going to be, um, we are getting ready to sign a contract to be paid annually for our carbon credits. <laughs> so, um, Basically, yeah. Wow. So for farming and feeding our animals, they're going to pay us. And then we still get to sell the animals. <laughs> love it. So, Sarah, Sarah, I'd love to talk to you about Silvo because I've been trying to figure that one out for – we've got uh, we've only got 20 acres, but we've got a good mix of uh, some woods here. And the, the county, the soil and water conservation, isn't interested because it's almost 100% uh, tree cover. And they – require they, they only want 30 percent so anyway um but i i want to mention to folks uh at least in minnesota uh bramble would uh, <coughs> so the county soil and water conservation tons of grants probably wisconsin too yeah um, and the US they're, they're going to replant our our whole pasture that is awesome yeah definitely also um check out your local um, NCRS, they just mm -hmm. got a new round of money for um, gr grazing and silver pastures mm -hmm. and different things like that. Um, I can't remember, $60 billion, I think. It's a, it's a huge, huge number. Um, there used to be a time, gosh, not even five years ago, when we were first doing silver pasture, that, you know, they summed their noses up at us because we were wackadoodles for thinking you could take a pasture vertical. And now it's like, oh, how can we help you? Um, so definitely encourage, yes, yeah, looking at stuff like that. Um, I'm trying to think what else to tell you, say. Anybody have any other thoughts or questions? I'm new here, but I'm curious, is anybody doing grain? It's oats, Becky. I, I do uh, a, a mix of Timothy hay pellets with some whole oats and black oil sunflower seeds. That's what I feed them twice a day, that plus they have the alfalfa all day. Where are you located? California. Okay. I've got a very small place. I only have an acre and a half total, and my goats don't have all that, so they get okay. everything from me. There's no pasture. Okay. I actually uh, started doing um, uh, protein tubs, or they're called some stress tubs or whatever you want to call them. For oh, yeah. When the, yeah, when the goats are in gestation. Uh, this is my second year doing that 
exclusively without grain during gestation. And last year, everybody that was pregnant did just fine. Um, mm. I'll I have great I have grain for lactation, and that's about it. It's only for the gals that I'm milking mostly. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we bring our goats into. We have a horse stable on the property that we purchased. Um, so the goats go into shelter every night, and so we bribe them in with a little bit of sweet feed. <laughs> uh, alfalfa mix in it, um, but it's not really their diet. It's like two cups between nine goats. Yeah, it's not a big serving, but it's enough that they get really excited and they all go into their stall, so it works great. <laughs> we use it as a bribe too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Our goats are essentially 100% forage fed, um, except for on the milk stand, we feed alfalfa, or we feed chaffe, which is a fermented alfalfa. And um, they are grain trained for treats and emergencies and a follow me. Um, heck, they are so grain trained now that we can actually get away with the blue coffee cup with just gravel in it. And this is <laughs> running. Um, yeah, but every once in a while you have to still throw grain because, you know, I'm afraid they'll get hip to the fact that, you know, it's just making noise. You're smart. We're not, yeah, we're not getting anything. Yeah. Sarah, where are you located? We're um, in Virginia. So okay. pretty warm. Geography here. makes a lot of difference. It makes a massive difference. Yeah. And, um, mm -hmm. and again, we've been on this property, gosh, this year will be 14 years. And, um, so we've done a lot of um, pasture, you know, put a lot of effort into pasture renovation, mainly free um, by grabbing, you know, cuttings and this and that and tossing this and that down. But um, it takes time, but it has well been worth it. And no matter what, we're in the middle of horse country, so you also have to have a be able to turn a blind eye to what neighbors think. Like, oh my God, that field looks horrible. No, no, it doesn't. It's the most it gorgeous purpose. thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, and my husband's over here saying, and we did it on purpose. In fact, yeah, I mean, we have, you know, these huge, you know, broadleaf wheat, what they call weeds, and all the stuff that they hate, and we just love it. It's awesome, and the goats love it, and the goats have done very well on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> But, and we are able to forage your almost basically year round. So I'm jealous. <laughs> so I definitely I don't know if you can do forage stocking in Minnesota and Wisconsin, but we do forage stock. Basically, um we have paddocks that we stop grazing in August and from August to November, December, and then we re start to reintroduce goats so that we have forage on the ground for them to eat during the winter. I actually yep. did a little experiment. I wouldn't mind doing it uh, again, but it was using, um, I had access to a deer. People like to plant deer plots. And so mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a high protein deer plot mix that did a lot of like different roots, like the turnips and um, those things. And I did keep the goats off from that and I let them have it after the snow started falling. And it was cool to see the goats like, they, I didn't believe it would happen, but they started actually like pulling up those roots, um, big root vegetables and stuff like that, and eating them like the turnips and everything. Really? Yeah, I was like, oh no, you guys huh. really did that? Yeah, my sheep farmer friends did that, and um, huh. it was just that that late protein punch that they tried for their lambs before market, and um, the goats totally ate the ate it ate it down. So I might try and do that again, but find a cheaper. Um, mix, but it's also finding um, like a, a no-till drill was used for the initial pasture planting, but I think I just broadcasted this seed, but the, I think doing no-till would be better for it to get it into the ground. So. Our, our Soil and Water Conservation District in Chisago County has a no-till for, for to borrow. Yeah. Um, so that yeah. might be something if you know, you can work with a, a local government agency. Well, I had gotten a grant from the NRCS to do pasture okay. um, improvement, and so I actually had my dad is used to be the implement dealer in my area, and so he totally <laughs> has like the stuff, you know. <laughs> so I got the no-till drill for free. It was cool. <laughs> nice. nice. Yeah. So yeah, I'm coming over to borrow it. 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Um, a lot of a lot of these tools are like free or really cheap to use for people mm -hmm. to see those the resources. Yeah. And I don't know if other areas do it, but our local co-op feed mills, they actually have um, tool implements that you can rent for relatively cheap by the day or week. So, you know, you take over your truck, hook it up to your hitch, and, you know, drive it down the road to your farm. Um, and so that's definitely cheaper than, um, yeah, the $100,000 for something to try to, you know. <laughs> You also got to have the tractor to pull it, though. Well, it, yeah. So we have a small compact tractor. So depending on what it is, you know. But um, mm -hmm. I definitely. But we're huge. We're huge proponents of frost seeding. Um, mm -hmm. and I'm guessing we're not doing that this year because you know we're not getting no. frost <laughs> in this weird weather. But um, yeah, there's definitely resources out there. I think it's just asking and looking and you know seeing what you can find. Mm -hmm. But um. Anyway, well, I don't have anything else. It was so good to see you guys. I'm so glad everybody was here. Um, suggestions for what to discuss next month? Anybody? It Aaron? might be maybe getting ready for kidding season because that's that's happening. Okay, we can definitely talk about kidding season. Anybody want to tackle the topic, or should I come prepared? Oh, I, it, it, I, I vote George. George takes us over. <laughs> Ooh, I love it. He 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 has he's had goats, and he's done kids, and and he's got a lot of goats. I. I <laughs> I'm a rookie here. This is my first time. You're throwing me under the bus. Thank you. <laughs> no, we're including you, George. And we would never throw anybody I'm, under the bus. That's just I'm not our you. <laughs> okay. You got it. Awesome. Kidding. Next. But Aaron has to bring a cocktail recipe for me. <laughs> I will. It's called a white Russian, but using goat milk. Ooh. Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, this is, this is a great group. We'll have to have a virgin version for Becky's son, she, unless she wants to yes, put them yep. to sleep quickly. Um, little little whiskey. <laughs> you never oh, heard. It. <laughs> Works great for the teething. Her sons look a little older than teething, but you know we could be wrong. <laughs> Use whatever I mean, excuse you got to. We're adult teeth, so we, we, we can go with that. <laughs> We're there. Awesome. I love, you guys are a great group. Thank you so much for coming. I will edit this last bunch out before I post it. <laughs> <laughs> but we probably don't want YouTube thinking that we're encouraging underage drinking and, you know, goat breeders. Oh. <laughs> yeah. No, we were talking about kids. Oh, kids. oh. Okay. The goat kids. Yes, goat kids. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, right? yeah. Well, Include thank that. You, thank you guys all for coming. Um, if you need anything, help with registration, questions, the association is here to help. And if you haven't renewed your membership, um, make sure you go to the website, org and um, get the form to renew. Otherwise, have a great night, and I will see everybody next month. Thank you. Bye. Bye.